Hello, hello, and welcome to the Morgan Library. My name is Miss Lindsay, and welcome to Teen Talk Tuesday. Now, the last book for the month of March, which is still Women's History Month, I will be reading Wonder Woman, Warbringer by Leah Bardugo. Wonder Woman, my favorite superhero, Warbringer. Here we go. <clears throat> Chapter 1 You do not enter a race to lose. Diana bounced lightly on her toes at the starting line, her calves taut as bowstrings, her mother's words reverberating in her ears. A noisy crowd had gathered for the wrestling matches and javelin throws that would mark the start of the Nemesean Games. But the real event was the foot race. And now the stands were buzzing with word that the queen's daughter had entered the competition. When Hippolyta had seen Diana amid the runners clustered on the arena stands, she displayed no surprise. As was tradition, she descended from her viewing platform to wish the athletes luck in their endeavors, sharing a joke here, offering a kind word of encouragement there. She had nodded briefly to Diana showing her no special favor. But she whispered, so low that only her daughter could hear, you do not enter a race to lose. Amazons lined the path that led out of the arena, already stamping their feet and chanting for the games to begin. On Diana's right, Rainy flashed her radiant smile. Good luck today. She was always kind, always gracious, and of course, always victorious. To Diana's left, Thera snorted and shook her head. She's going to need it. Diana ignored her. She'd been looking forward to this race for weeks, a trek across the island to retrieve one of the red flags hung beneath the great dome of Bala Mingdal. In a flat-out sprint, she didn't have a chance. She still hadn't come to the fullness of her Amazon strength. You will in time, her mother had promised. But her mother promised a lot of things. This race was different. It required strategy, and Diana was ready. She'd been training in secret, running sprints with Maeve, and plotting a route that had tougher terrain, but was definitely a straighter shot to the western tip of the island. She'd even, well, she hadn't exactly spied. She'd gathered intelligence on the other Amazons in the race. She was still the smallest, and of course the youngest. But she'd shut up in the last year, and she was nearly as tall as Thera now. I don't need luck, she told herself. I have a plan. She glanced down the row of Amazons gathered at the starting line like troops ready for war and amended. But a little luck wouldn't hurt either. She wanted that laurel crown. It was better than any royal circlet or tiara, an honor that couldn't be given, that had to be earned. She found Maeve's red hair and freckled face in the crowd and grinned, trying to project confidence. Maeve returned the smile and gestured with both hands, as if she were tapping down the air. She mouthed the words, steady on. Diana rolled her eyes, but nodded and tried to slow her breathing. She had a bad habit of coming out too fast and wasting her speed too early. Now, she cleared her mind and forced herself to concentrate on the course as Tecmessa walked the line, surveying the runners, jewels glinting on her thick corona of curls, silver bands flashing on her brown arms. She was Hippolyta's closest advisor, second in rank only to the queen, and she carried herself as if her belted indigo shift were battle armor. Take it easy, Pixis, Tech murmured to Diana as she snorted. Wouldn't want to see you crack. Diana heard Derna snort again but she refused to flinch at the nickname. You won't be smirking when I'm on the victor's podium, she promised. Tech raised her hands for silence and bowed to Hippolyta, who sat between two other members of the Amazon Council in the Royal Lodge. A high platform, shaded by a silken overhang, dyed in the vibrant red and blue of the queen's colors. <sighs> Diana knew that was where her mother wanted her right now, seated beside her waiting for the start of the games instead of competing. None of that would matter when she won. Hippolyta dipped her chin the barest amount, 
elegant in her white tunic and riding trousers, a simple circlet rusting against her forehead. She looked relaxed, at her ease, as if she might decide to leap down and join the competition at any time. But still, every inch the queen. Tech addressed the athletes gathered on the arena sands. In whose honor do you compete? For the glory of the Amazons, they replied in unison. For the glory of our queen, Diana felt her heart beat harder. She had never said the words before, not as a competitor. To whom do we give praise every day? Tech trumpeted. Hera, they chorused. Athe Athena, Demeter, Hestia, Aphrodite, Artemis, the goddesses who had created the mascara and gifted it to Hippolyta as a place of refuge. Tech paused, and along the line, Diana heard the whispers of other names. Oya, Durga, Freya, Mary, Yale. Names once cried out in death, the last prayers of female warriors fallen in battle, the words that had brought them to the island and given them new life as Amazons. Beside Diana, Rainy murmured the names of the demon-fighting Matri, the seven mothers, and pressed the rectangular amulet she always wore to her lips. Tech raised the blood-red flag identical to those that would be waiting for the runners in Banna Migdal. May the island guide you to just victory, she shouted. She dropped the red silk. The crowd roared. The runners surged forward the eastern arch. Like that, the race had begun. Diana and Maeve had anticipated a bottleneck, but Diana still felt a pang of frustration as runners clawed the stone throat of the tunnel. A tangle of white tunics and muscled limbs. Footsteps echoing off the stone, all of them trying to get clear of the arena at once. Then they were on the road, sprinting across the island, each runner choosing their own course. You do not enter a race to lose. Diana set her pace to the rhythm of those words, bare feet slapping the packed earth of the road that would lead her through the tangle of the Sibelian woods to the island's northern coast. Ordinarily, a miles-long trek through the forest would be a slow one, hampered by fallen trees and tangles of vines so thick they had to be hacked through with a blade you didn't mind dulling. But Diana had plotted her way well. An hour after she entered the woods, she burst from the trees onto the deserted coast road. The wind lifted her hair, and salt spray lashed her face. She breathed deep, checked the position of the sun. She was going to win. Not just place, but win. She'd mapped out the course the week before with Maeve, and they'd run it twice in secret in the gray light hours of early morning, when their sisters were first rising from their beds, when the kitchen fires were still being kindled, and the only curious eyes they'd have to worry about belonged to anyone up early to hunt game or cast nets for the day's catch. But hunters kept to the woods and meadows farther south, and no one fished off this part of the coast. There was no good place to launch a boat, just the steep steel-colored cliffs plunging straight down to the sea and a tiny, unwelcoming cove that could only be reached by a path so narrow he had to shuffle down sideways, back press the rock. The northern shore was gray, grim, and inhospitable, and Diana kept every inch of its secret landscape, its crags and caves, its tide pools teeming with limpets and anemones. It was a good place to be alone. The island seeks to please, her mother had told her. It was why the mascara was forested by redwoods in some places and rubber trees in another. Why? Why you would spend an afternoon roaming the grasslands of a scoop neck pony and the evening atop a camel, scaling a moonlit dragonback of sand dunes. They were all pieces of the lives the Amazon had led before they came to the island, the little landscapes of the heart. Diana sometimes wondered if the mascara had called the northern coast into being just for her so that she could challenge herself climbing on the sheer drop of its cliffs, so that she could have a place to herself when the weight of being Hippolyta's daughter got to be too much. You do not enter a race to lose. Her mother had not been issuing a general warning. Diana's losses meant something different, and they both knew it, and not only because she was a princess. Diana could almost feel Tex's knowing gaze on her, hearing the mocking in her voice. Take it easy, Pixies. 
That was a nickname Tech had given her. Pixis. A little gray pot made to stone jewels, or a tincture of carmine for pink in the lips. The name was harmless, meant to tease, always said in love, or so Tech claimed. But it stung every time. A reminder that Diana was not like the other Amazons, and never would be. Her sisters were battle-proven warriors, steel forged from suffering and home to greatness as they passed from life to immortality. All of them had earned their place on Themyscira. All but Diana, born of the island soil and Hippolyta's longing for a child, fashioned from clay by her mother's hands, hollow and breakable. Take it easy, Pixis. Wouldn't want to see you crack. Diana steadied her breathing. Kept her pace even. Not today, Tech. This day, the laurel belongs to me. She spared the briefest glance at the horizon, letting the sea breeze cool the sweat off her brow. Through the mist, she glimpsed the white shape of a ship. It had come close enough to the boundary that Diana could make out its sails. The craft was small. A schooner, maybe? She had trouble remembering nautical details. Mainmast, mizzenmast, a thousand names for sails and not for rigging. It was one thing to be out on a boat, learning from Tetua, who had sailed with Il with Illyrian pirates, but quite another to be stuck in the library of the Ephesium, staring glazed-eyed at diaphragms of a brigantine or a caravel. Sometimes Diana and Maeve made a game of trying to spot ships or planes, and once they'd even seen a fat blob of a cruise ship on the horizon. But most mortals knew to steer clear of their particular corner of the Aegean, where compasses <clears throat> spun and instruments suddenly refused to obey. Today, it looked like a storm was picking up past the mists of the boundary, and Diana was sorry she couldn't stop to watch it. The rains that came to the mosquero were tediously gentle and predictable, nothing like the threatening rumble of thunder, the shimmer of a far-off lightning strike. Do you ever miss storms? Diana had asked one afternoon as she and Maeve lay on the palace's sun-silked rooftop terrace, listening to the distant roar and clatter of a tempest. Maeve had died in a crossberry ambush, and the last words of her lips are prayer to St. Bridget of Kildare. She was new to the island by Amazon standards, and came from Clark, where storms were common. No, Maeve had said in her lilting voice, I miss a good cup of tea. Dancing, boys. Definitely lot rain. We dance, Diana protested. Maeve had just laughed. You dance differently when you know you won't live forever. Then she stretched, freckles like dense clouds of pollen on her white skin. I think I was a cat in another life, because all I want is to lie around sleeping in the world's biggest sunbeam. Steady on, Diana resisted the urge to speed forward. It was hard to remember to keep something in reserve with the early morning sun on her shoulders and the wind on her back. She felt strong, but it was easy to feel strong when she was on her own. A boom sounded over the waves, a hard metallic clap like a door slamming. Diana's steps faltered. On the blue horizon, a billowing column of smoke rose, flames licking at its base. The schooner was on fire, its prow blown to splinters and one of its masts smashed, the sail dragging over the rails. Diana found herself slowly slowing but forced her stride back on pace. There was nothing she could do for the schooner. Planes crashed. Ships were wrecked upon the rocks. That was the nature of the mortal world. It was a place where disaster could happen and often did. Human life was a tide of misery, one that could never reach the island shores. Diana focused her eyes on the path. Far, far ahead, she could see sunlight gleaming gold off the great dome at Banna Migdal. First, the red flag. Then the laurel crown. That was the plan. From somewhere on the wind, she heard a cry. A goal, she told herself. A girl, some other voice within her insisted. Impossible. A human shell couldn't carry over such a great distance, could it? It didn't matter. There was nothing she could do. And yet, her eyes strayed back to the horizon. I just want to get a better view, she told herself. I have plenty of time. I'm ahead. There was no good reason to leave the ruts of the old cart track, no logic to veering out over the rocky point, but she did it anyway. And that was part one, chapter one.
of Wonder Woman, Warbringer by Leah Bardugo. Thank you very much for joining me today, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.